If we're going to talk about the philosophy of sharing our faith, what better place to start than Athens and the story of the Apostle Paul's visit there found in Acts 17? Most of us know Athens as the modern capital of Greece, where both democracy and the Olympic Games were born. The city was home to great thinkers like Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, but by the first century, 500 years had passed since the city's golden age, and the Greek Empire had been taken over by the Romans. Still, Athens was a cultural and intellectual center filled with some of the world's most stunning art and architecture. Paul goes there to share his faith. You may have noticed, but it's getting to be a little bit of a no-no these days to share your faith. The line usually goes something like this. What gives you the right to foist your faith on anybody else? They don't want your faith, or they've got their own faith, or what makes you think your faith is the right faith to begin with? Actually, I agree with lots of that. We have absolutely no right to pressure anyone or to denigrate anybody else's religion. On top of that, I agree that our faith is no better and no different than anybody else's. Unless Jesus came back from the dead, in which case he does have a right to exclusivity and a right to our allegiance. But even then, we need to be humble and respectful and we need to be gentle when we're trying to share our faith with other people. My favorite definition of evangelism is this. It's just one beggar telling another beggar where to find food. An intellectual himself, Paul would have been right at home among the philosophers, but he wasn't Greek, he was Turkish, from Tarsus, a city in southeastern Turkey. He was born to a wealthy Jewish family, so he was educated. And as a devout Jew, he began his career by persecuting the newly established Christian church, thinking he was doing God a favor. Then came his vision of Jesus on the road to Damascus and his conversion to Christianity. For the last 30 years of his life, he traveled 10,000 miles by foot and sea, spreading the gospel from Judea and around the Mediterranean, eventually reaching Athens. In Athens, shrines, temples, and statues filled the public space. Many have been preserved, so we have a pretty good idea what the city would have looked like, but with one big difference. Back in the day, the statues and buildings were painted in vivid colors, which faded over time. It would have been impossible to look away from the daunting and dazzling array of images. But not all of them were seen in the same way. Some statues were war heroes or emperors like Hadrian or athletes and local dignitaries. But there were also images of the Greek gods, and people believed those statues had divine power and were actually worshipped. They're even called worship statues. Here's an example, the statue of the god Asclepius, the god of healing. For us, modern, it's in one room with all the other statues. But for ancient people, he was uniquely different. On a daily basis, there were a variety of activities associated with divine statues that separated them from other statues. There were ceremonies, there were sacrifices, there were rituals and processions, and all those made those statues unique and religious. Asclepius and many other statues like him were divine, sacred statues. All the other statues were just non-worship statues. They were there, but they were not divine, and they were not associated with the religious realm. So it was likely those worship statues that gave Paul the most grief. Why? Well, because he was a devout Jew. He had spent most of his time in Jerusalem where he wouldn't have found a single solitary religious statue. And here Athens is just filled with them. He's upset because of the Ten Commandments. Number two says, you must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for other gods. So just imagine how Paul must have felt, bombarded by this deluge of idolatry. We're told he went to the synagogue to reason with the Jews and Gentiles. Then he went to the public square and spoke daily to all those who happened to be there. Now, why would Paul go to the synagogue? Well, because that's where his fellow Jews were, the people waiting for the Messiah without recognizing that Jesus was the one. 
The lesson for us is that we need to start by reaching out to people who have an understanding of God. And I'm not talking about raiding sheep from other churches. We don't have a monopoly on truth and righteousness, so instead, we need to reach out to those people who understand the necessity of spirituality, but just don't know how to channel it through Jesus. In other words, start with the receptive, but don't limit yourself to the already receptive. Paul spoke daily in that public square to all who happened to be there, and he took on all comers. During his time in Athens, Paul taught and probably worked in the commercial section of the Agora, or marketplace, right below the Acropolis. Now, his time in the marketplace allowed Paul to come into contact with people from all walks of life. As you can see, the Agora from the Roman period, right next to the ancient Agora, has been remarkably preserved, including buildings, streets, statues, and altars. For generations now, many of us in the church have had this field of dreams mentality about our meeting places. If we build them, they will come. Well, not anymore. At a time when many people have never even been inside a church building, we need to go to them. And in one way, we've already done that by renting space here in a community center. But the big question for us is, how are we going to more effectively connect with those people who come through the doors for other things? The public square was near the Acropolis, a fortified hilltop crowned by the Parthenon, which was a giant temple housing a towering statue of Athena, the goddess of wisdom, after whom Athens was named. We're told Paul had a debate with Epicurean and Stoic philosophers, and as we're about to see, that debate was calm, respectful, and rooted in logic. In a nutshell, the Stoics followed a man named Zeno, who taught that happiness was found in knowledge and virtue, the rejection of pleasure, and living without complaint in harmony with the will of the gods and nature. On the other extreme, Epicureans followed the philosophy of Epicurus, who rejected the idea that everything's determined by the gods, and he embraced the notion that happiness was found in pleasure and freedom, freedom from both fear of death and fear of the gods. Paul almost certainly told the Stoics real knowledge and wisdom was found in Christ, who makes it possible to live in harmony with God. And he would have told the Epicureans that freedom was found not in pleasure, but in the peace with God that Jesus made possible on the cross, a peace that means we no longer have to fear death. In Colossians 2, Paul says, In Jesus lie hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense from human thinking. For in him lives all the fullness of God in a human body. So you also are complete through your union with Christ. But Paul is not anti-intellectual. He uses reason, logic, evidence, and experience, including his own experience. And that's what we have to do too. If all you've got is, the Bible tells me so, most unbelievers won't give you the time of day. You need to know not only what you believe, you have to do the hard work to figure out why you believe it. And that means asking the tough questions. And the best place to start is where Paul does, the resurrection. At first, the Athenians just don't know what to do with this guy. So they take him to the city's high council, a group of 100 scholars, philosophers, and prominent citizens. If you wanted to promote a new religion, you needed their say-so. And look how Paul begins. He says, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth, and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands, as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else.
Paul is not rude, arrogant, or dismissive. Instead, he starts by acknowledging the good things he sees in their spirituality and uses that to find common ground. So too, when we're talking to people, we need a humble attitude that allows us to see their dignity, integrity, and sincerity. Where there are things we hold in common, let's affirm those. And where there are differences, let's challenge gently the ideas and assumptions that people have, but never question their integrity or their motives. It's not rocket science. Jesus is the one who said, if you want to treat people right, treat them the way you want to be treated. And please, if you're going to talk to people about faith, let's focus on the important things. Things like God's love, the divinity of Jesus seen in the resurrection, and the need to serve others. At a time when many people don't even know who Jesus is, except for maybe a stereotype or two, it seems absolutely pointless to start with doctrine, church traditions, or the stupid stuff that divides believers. Normally, we start by telling people what they've got wrong. But notice the council members respond to Paul's humility. He's not harsh or critical. Essentially, he says, you're on the right path, but you just haven't gone far enough. Not because you're evil or stupid, but because you haven't had the chance to know. In return, the Athenians are open and not dismissive. Come and tell us about this new teaching, they say. And Luke adds about the Athenians, they seem to spend all their time discussing new ideas. Sound just like today? And like today, people were hedging their bets. In a world of many gods, they were so afraid of leaving one out among their idols and shrines, they made an altar to that unknown god. Paul picks up on that and says, This god whom you worship without knowing is the one I'm telling you about. So, Paul communicates that he's not representing a foreign god, but the one they're already worshiping without realizing it. The one who created the world. But the apostle is not afraid to respectfully confront their assumptions. Look at what he tells them. The one true God does not live in human temples. He doesn't need our religious rituals and sacrifices, and it's he who gives life to us, not the other way around. Then Paul goes on to stress what's found in God, unity, sovereignty, and intimacy. He created all the nations, the apostle says. He decided beforehand when they should rise and fall, and he determined their boundaries. His purpose was for the nations to seek after God and perhaps feel their way toward Him and find Him, though He's not far from any one of us. For in Him we live and move and exist. As some of your own poets have said, we are His children. And since this is true, we shouldn't think of God as an idol of gold, silver, or stone. Notice again the common ground and the logic. Paul says, even your own poets say, we are the children of God. And since we're not gold, silver, or stone, neither is our Father. And you don't need those reminders of His presence because He's right here. It seems to me that's our message today too. We have to convince people they don't need their idols, whether it's work, sex, money, or power, because God is right here and He wants us to seek Him. Paul goes on to say, God overlooked people's ignorance about these things in earlier times, but now he commands everyone everywhere to repent of their sins and turn to him. For he has set a day for judging the world with justice by the man he has appointed, and he proved to everyone who this is by raising him from the dead. So the cross is the crux, the essential issue. And if the resurrection didn't happen, then nobody has to worry about sin because we're all on our own and there's nothing to suggest there's a life after this one. And by the way, that is precisely what lots of people today believe. And I get that. There is no absolute proof of the resurrection, just compelling evidence. And if you can't make a logical case for that, you need to do the homework so that you can explain to people why you think we're on the right path. Then combine that with the story of how God is working in your life. Even so, be ready for mixed results. In Athens, some laughed in contempt, some said, we want to hear more on this later, and others were convinced and became believers, including Dionysius, a member of the city council, and a prominent woman named Damaris. But results are not your department. Your job is not to convert anybody. Your role is to be a faithful witness to God's love and power, serve others sacrificially, and live a life of gratitude for all the Lord has done for you. So. To tell your story best, follow Paul's example. Be humble, gentle, and respectful. Start with yourself and make sure you don't have any idols taking God's place. 
take the initiative and don't expect people to come to you. Start with those already interested in spiritual things, but don't restrict yourself to those immediately receptive. Keep an open mind and an open heart. Have some intelligent arguments about why today's philosophies just aren't working, and know what you believe, but know why you believe it. Find common ground and affirm the sincerity, integrity, and dignity of those you're talking to. Gently challenge their assumptions, but never their character or motives. Focus on the important issues, especially Jesus and the resurrection, and don't worry about results. Just be faithful. Like Jesus, Paul eventually paid for his convictions with his life. Now, nobody is going to ask you to do that. But if you have found something good in God, you have an obligation to share that with anybody who's interested. So this week, keep the faith. Just don't keep it to yourself. See you next time.